Uh, hi everyone, thank you for joining us. Uh, hopefully you're having a, uh, a good and informative uh, Cyber Month and we appreciate your time. Uh, just a short sort of 45, 60 minute session, we're going to try and cover three, four topics here. Uh, so to kick it off, we're going to ask uh, Irene Coyle, the Training uh, Director from uh, OSP, and Irene will be covering protecting data from cyber attacks within the GDPR world. We're then going to move on to Nick from CyberPrism. Uh, and that's going to cover off some uh, cyber defense of uh, OT operational technology. Uh, we'll segue into Mike from IBM, and uh, Mike will be covering uh, cyber defense and compliance, uh, again within GDPR and relevant to Article 32. And I'll be wrapping up just for a short presentation on cyber resiliency, uh, backup and recovery again hopefully addressing some of the uh, challenges that have been pushed out for, uh, uh, from the FCA in relation to Article 32. So without much further ado, if I can ask Irene to pick up the mantle, introduce herself, and uh, hopefully uh, we'll have an interesting and informative debate at the end. Over to yourself, Irene. Thank you. Thanks very much for having me on this webinar. I'm delighted to be alongside Mike, John and Nick, uh, IBM Celerity and CyberPRISM. I'm going to be looking at cyber security risk assessment. Now, I don't like using article numbers, but Article 32 from GDPR has become quite a familiar um, phrase to organisations since it came in in 2018. And it very clearly sets out your technical and organisational measures that you need to implement to comply with data protection requirements. So we all know that that's going to be slightly different for each organisation and it does depend on the type of personal data that you're processing and the risks that that type of data will pose to you. Now clearly higher risk would be through special category data and sensitive data. So that in itself poses challenges for organisations to try and work out what measures are right and appropriate for them. So one of the first things that you need to do to, is to assess the technical security risk and then put in the appropriate technical controls for your organisation. So that sounds really, really easy. So on you go, job done, tick. But actually, it's not so easy if you don't have the skills or the knowledge to do that risk assessment in the first place or to consider what is actually appropriate. So are we speaking about technical solutions or how staff use your own systems? Is it about having policies and procedures put in place? What are the potential threats and vulnerabilities for you as an organisation? So take a step back and think about it and then involve others in undertaking the security risk assessment because perspectives from others can show new risks that you hadn't even thought of and that's really beneficial to, to involve others. So the ISO, Information Commissioner's Office, has recently worked with the National Cyber Security Centre, so NCSC, and that was to provide a guide for organisations to have an approach that they could then take if they didn't have that skill set and knowledge. And they break that down into four basic approach areas. Um, and that will significantly help you if you follow that four-step approach to have the right security risk assessment and to meet Article 32 of GDPR. So what are the four approaches? It's about managing security risk, protecting personal data from cyber attacks and detecting security events and minimising the impact. So I'm going to look at and focus on the outcome of protecting personal data from cyber attacks and look at the security outcomes that you as an organisation should be trying to actually achieve. So if we look at the slide, protecting personal data from cyber attacks. Now, whether you've already got the in-house expertise, that's excellent, or whether you use the services of an external company or a cyber security and data protection consultant, these are the steps that will help you protect the personal data that your organisation is processing from a cyber attack. Now, unfortunately, there is not a 100% guarantee from a cyber attack with a level of sophistication and the social engineering tactics that are now being used um, to try and target uh, organisations and attack them. But by doing nothing, you're certainly going to be much more vulnerable to attack than if you take the steps that I'm going to go through. So the first one is about service protection policies and processes. 
So what have you currently put in place? Have you a written, sorry, having a written down policy for your systems to protect data does not actually mean that it's effective or that it's known or that it's being followed by your staff. So have you communicated and enforced that those policies and processes are, are actually being enforced and, and are being used by the staff that is operating within that organisation? Um, so it's not just about having the policies and procedures, it's actually about having them written down, followed, and you're checking that they actually are effective. I quite often say um, to organisations that I work with, is it written down somewhere? How do the appropriate staff know where to find those policies and processes? And how do you know that they're actively following those procedures? How do you evidence that? So a good practice and a suggestion would be to use Information Security Management System, so ISMS. And how your ISMS should be structured is quite critical. And whether you're following an ISO standard like 27001, which is the international standard for managing information security, that will certainly help you uh, within your organisation and your organisation. But it's not just keeping your data safe that would also demonstrate to potential new clients that you have information security under control and provide them with the confidence to use your organisation because their data will be, will be safe. The next step is identify and access control. So by that we mean think about and ensure specific users only get access to perform their specific function. It doesn't mean that the managing director, for example, actually needs to have access to everything, whether they want it or not. It has to be specific to the function that they are actually undertaking. Do you actually then remove access when any members of your staff no longer need it or leave the organisation or they just move around departments so actually a specific function will change? Um, do you document what the user access rights are? Do you authenticate the users going onto your systems? What about two-factor authentication? Do you restrict what your end users within your organisation can download um, when they're transferring data, what data they can actually de delete? That's all about um, identifying and accessing their control. Do you have audit trails within your systems? So if something unfortunately goes wrong, have we got an audit trail that we can go and actually check to see why something has happened and was it deliberate um, and was it part of an attack? What about robust password policies? It's, it's, not, it's not just sufficient to have a password policy in place, but to make sure that that policy is robust enough so that your, your team and your staff aren't able to create weak passwords. And obviously, you should be changing any default passwords and remove and suspend unused accounts as well. So data security then, in terms of the next step, what have you put in place to prevent anybody who's not authorised or any unlawful processing of the personal data within your organisation? And we're speaking there about both internally and externally. So thinking about potential threat actors, and depending on your organisation and the business that you're operating within, who would actually want to attack and gain access to your data? So by thinking about those things, it will help you identify the security measures and the level of security that you're actually needing. So what about unauthorised access to user devices, storage media, backups, um, interception of data when it's in transit or even when the data's at rest? And it's even about accessing data when you think it's, it's clear and there's no data on it, but it's actually within the memory if you're getting some of your devices repaired or sent for disposal. And then lastly, think about encryption as well. System security then is like tracking and recording all your assets that process the personal data within your organisation, actively managing software vulnerabilities, patching, minimising the opportunity for attack by configuring technology appropriately, and minimising the available services that can be used. That will enhance the system security. And then again, just to go back about encryption, encrypting personal data when it's at rest on your devices, that will certainly help and benefit the system security measures that you put in place. Now, the fifth step um, within protecting personal data from a cyber attack is staff awareness and training. And 
I think this is most important, not because of my role within OSP Cyber Academy, but actually to reduce the security risks within your organisation. So you could have all the policies and procedures in place, documented, and you can have the data and the system security in place. But if your staff or your, the end users on your systems and devices have not been trained or educated, to me that exposes a greater risk. And not only does the ICO and NCSC identify that staff awareness and training is one of the security outcomes that you should be striving to have for data protection compliance, in Article 32, technical measures, but if you look at any research across the internet and through various research organisations, cyber security threats for 2022, one of the major threats that you will identify quite quickly is not doing staff awareness and training for security of data and cyber security. And if you think about it, if your customers are the main victims of cyber crimes from their personal data being compromised and exposed through a cyber attack, then you will need to protect your reputation as an organisation and also protect your customers and me if I'm within that organisation, so your own staff's personal data too. And you do that by raising awareness among your staff to identify and to prevent network cyber attacks. Now, many people within organisations are just not aware of what cyber attack methods are, and that's quite understandable. But more importantly, they also don't know how they can play a part in reducing the chances and the likelihood of attacks actually being successful within the organisation and their part to play in that. So there's many ways that you can engage your staff in education programmes, whether it's online, whether it's face-to-face -face training, whether it's um, educational workshops, and even through the communication methods that you get that information out and into your organisation. And as well as raising cyber attack methods with staff from a data protection perspective, it's one of my hats, training should be given for your employees as to how to deal with and share the confidential and corporate data so that they're going to avoid making those mistakes that actually result in data being lost or compromised, so by sending it to the wrong recipient as a simple example. So on the last slide here, staff awareness and training, for me the four key elements that you need to consider in any staff awareness and training programme that you're putting in is to have, the first of all, that you encourage your senior leaders to lead by example. So all the, you know, the senior members in your organisation, they will be setting the culture and the tone of cyber security and data protection. So they should be leading by example. And if they're not doing that, then that's not going to send the right message uh, to be followed by staff across the organisation. The second key element is about building effective dialogue with your staff. So do you actually, as an organisation, understand all the roles? Do your policies create barriers for staff to undertake those roles? Because you'll certainly find, and I've found, that if something is difficult to follow, then people will find a workaround. And that is when they then expose your organisation and the data that's been processed to more security risk. So make sure there's effective dialogue with your staff. The third key element is consider running security awareness campaigns by making sure that you communicate and your message in a manner that is positive, um, that's achievable for your staff and it's relevant for your staff. I'm sure you know countless times within organisations that communications come out and you start reading it and, and engaging with it and you realise it's just not relevant to what we're going to do. So make sure that you're trying to get the positive, achievable and relevant um, campaigns to the different people across your organisation. And then the last key element is about tailoring the cybersecurity training to address your needs. So what are the cybersecurity risks and data protection needs for your organisation? There's a multitude of different training providers out there, but does the offering of specific training providers meet your organisation's needs? So there's a balancing act there. You need to make sure that if you are engaging externally, then you're making sure that the offering is actually going to meet what your organisational cybersecurity risks are for your staff. So that's the four key elements from my point of view for protecting cyber security attacks um, from occurring. Now, if, if the National Cyber Security Centre recognise that these steps are required for engaging and training your staff, 
to increase your cyber security and to ensure that you are putting the technical measures in place for Article 32 under data protection and GDPR, then I hope the security outcomes approach that I've covered in the last 10 minutes will help your organisation. And should you need any further advice and support to implement any cyber security data protection training programme, then there's obviously lots of people and organisations that you can get in touch with, including myself. Thank you. Marvellous. That was uh, excellent. Thank you very, very much for that uh, succinct summary there, Eileen. Really appreciated. Uh, if I could just now pass on to Nick. Uh, Nick will be covering briefly cyber defence within the operational technology landscape. Nick, over to yourself, Nick. I'd like to make you think about the idea of segregation within your network. Um, what we see within the work that we're doing in critical national infrastructure at the moment is a disconnect between what the business perceives as required and what is actually happening within the network. When we look at uh, the critical national infrastructure, obviously you've got a lot of operational technology, which is the stuff which uh, ensures the lights remain on and the water keeps coming out of the taps. And then of course you've got the enterprise above it. We see a need for data flows from the OT up into the enterprise space. And of course this needs to be well managed. In order to perform that management, you need to understand what applications are running within your system, but also um, the ports and the protocols used. That then allows you to use a good quality OT aware uh, segregation device so that then it can effectively ensure that the, the data flows are managed. We also need to see visibility into the network. This goes back to the underlying need for a good quality asset register. Once you start looking at the assets and the applications running on those assets, it should become quite apparent that there's a lot of applications that are running and being used within the organisation that may not actually be um, compliant, patched, um, updated. Of course, you'll see a lot of people within the OT space talking about um, air gap networks. Of course, there is no actual thing such as an air gap network because there's always the sneaker net. These systems have to be updated, um, patches have to be applied. So there is the use of removable media. If you can reduce the amount of applications running on those um, potentially air gap systems, this reduces the load and the requirement for the patching. So just taking a simple example, we see in a lot of instances the use of uh, Adobe Acrobat's reader because, of course, PDFs for manuals and uh, guides for equipment comes in, in uh, PDF format. The modern operating system, of course, with a browser such as Edge, renders those PDFs perfectly adequately. So that by removing that uh, Adobe Acrobat reader, it reduces the attack surface. Uh, and it's one less thing which needs to be patched. When we look for the segregation, we've got, of course, the crown jewels, which are the applications and parts of the system which the whole uh, enterprise relies upon. And then there are, of course, other applications and endpoints which are important for the business, otherwise you wouldn't have them, but they're not vital for the continued delivery of the water, the electricity, the gas, etc. By segregating properly and ensuring that only the endpoints that need to talk to one another do, using only the protocols that are required, you massively reduce the attack surface. And it's that management of the attack surface that allows you to manage the risk. Of course, risk is a product of likelihood and consequence. And when you're operating critical national infrastructure, the consequences, you can't impact those, like you can't affect those. The, uh, the potential of loss of water or loss of electricity is uh, the reason for the um, news regulation. So that means that then you can only impact and affect the likelihood of an incident. 
in cyber we look at likelihood as being the product of the threat and the vulnerabilities. And again, threat is something which you have very little control over. We're seeing at the moment, of course, the critical national infrastructure is being targeted by both state actors and state sanctioned actors coming from um, Russia, China, North Korea, etc. So this means that effectively all that you can do is manage those vulnerabilities. And again, this goes back to reduce your attack surface, reduce your applications, uh, make sure things are patched, but by segregating and having visibility into the network, it will allow you to manage the vulnerabilities. Vulnerabilities, when you talk to IT professionals, of course, immediately get put into the technical bucket. But of course, as Irene said earlier, you need to look at the training of your staff in order that you can then manage the vulnerabilities associated with the people and the processes. Your um, security professionals will always say the human is the weakest element in the security chain, but it has the potential to be uh, one of the strongest links in that security chain. So for me, I think the thing which I want to try and ensure that uh, is appreciated is by looking at the vulnerabilities of your systems, you can then see how you're going to segregate your network and by having the visibility into the network using the right sort of tools, you can then manage that risk. Thanks for that, Nick. Very short, punchy and informative. Absolutely appreciate it there, sir. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to bring in Mike from IBM now, who's the uh, Threat Landscape Director for EMEA. Uh, Mike will be covering uh, at a high level cyber defence and compliance and again, relevance within GDPR, uh, GDPR sorry, and uh, Article 32. Thanks for your time, Mike. If I could just hand this back to yourself, uh, that would be excellent. Over to you, Mike. Hello, my name is Mike Kehoe, and I am the IBM European Threat Management Program Director. And for the next eight to 10 minutes, I'm going to just talk about uh, cyber defense and compliance. And maybe not coach it or uh, place it into a product type world, but just talk about in general what what is important and what should the cyber defenders of different industries be looking at. So let me just talk about cyber defense and compliance. Uh, they make funny bedfellows for the want of a better uh, discussion because compliance has very little to do with an effective uh, cyber defense. And what I mean by that is that just because you're compliant to a specific rule doesn't mean that you actually ha are, uh, you can defend against that. So an example of this, if you take a look at what happened in Japan just 10 years ago, of course, the Fukushima nuclear power plant was compliant to the height of their seawall. But unfortunately, Mother Nature sent a uh, tsunami that was two meters above that. And we all know what happened to the uh, Fukushima uh, nuclear plant. So again, but I've talked with all, when I work, talk with clients, they actually see that, oh, because I'm compliant, I must be safe. And that's not the case. And again, cyber aggressors really couldn't care less about your compliance. But what I do say is that cyber defenses do have a lot to do with the effectiveness of compliance. Because if we let our cyber defenses wane a little, we're not up to speed, we, we don't apply correct protocols to them, we can come uh, unstuck with regulators and compliance. And I'm going to show you a little bit about that. So on my next slide, the I'm going to talk about the four R's of impacts of cybercrime. And of course, the very first impact from cybercrime is what we call the revenue, revenue loss. And that could be if somebody does a ransomware against your organization and you have to pay to get the uh, encryption keys back, well, you're going to have revenue loss. If somebody takes your bank account details and cleans money from your bank. Well, usually the bank will cover that, but if it's maybe your uh, an account like a, a trading account where you're liable for that, you could lose money on that. So revenue is the, the first R of cyber impacts are revenue. 
The next one is reputation. We've seen it in the past where organizations have had significant cyber breaches and there was a retailer in the United States a few years ago, significant cyber breach and a lot of their customers' credit cards were stolen. And since then, they've seen actually up to uh, a couple of months after that, a significant footfall of people coming into their retail locations because they just didn't trust them. So they had a reputational impact. And then as you go into the next one down is the uh, run cost, and which is more proactive. You, you get that, unfortunately, the threat, uh, uh, the threat uh, scape is a very, very aggressive and evolving location. And we constantly have to tool up uh, to make sure we, we move fast in the speed of threat. But also we have to increase run costs because we do have regulations that say you have to have this type of uh, uh, reporting. You have to be able to show this and show on and so forth. So we have to be proactive uh, around that. And finally, the, the, the fourth R of uh, cybercrime is regulatory. If we do have a breach, if significant amount of data is lost, well, we will get fined by regulators. And a regulator is such the GDPR or the HEPA and so on. So there are huge impacts uh, uh, from cybercrime against our organizations. And again, I like them to define them into the four R's. So let me explain, well, why would I want a regulator? Well, simple as the regulator is there to keep the uh, general public and uh, society safe. Because if I was a, a doctor's surgery and maybe somebody had broken in with a cyber attack and taken a lot of my patient's records, well, how would that affect me? It probably mightn't affect me. Maybe I might have some patients think that oh, I'm going to leave your practice. But again, if I'm in a, a large medical practice, I could probably backfill those patients. But the regulators there say, no, those were confidential information. You should not have lost it. We're going to fine you. So the regulator there is to protect society as a whole. And there are, and, and you can, we can lose various things. And why do people want to break into the information? Well, you can see on the dark web, I'll put here on the, on the uh, slide, that different parts of personal information or per, uh, personal attributes can actually sell for different amounts. And what I just said earlier, patient data can sell up to two and a half thousand US dollars because it's very difficult to change patient data. And also if you have patient data, you might be able to go to a pharmacy and be able to extract things like opioids or, or other uh, very, very powerful uh, controlled substances. So you see that the regulator there is to protect society and therefore we have responsibility as organizations to society, but the, and the regulator is gonna set the tone of what we need to do. So let me just move on to GDPR. There's actually, uh, and GDPR is just one of many, many other regulators around the world, but I'm just gonna use this as a, uh, an example. I did mention that there is proactive and, and reactive. And if I talk about reactive, you know, the, the fines from the regulators can be substantial. They can be up to 20 million or 4% of your worldwide turnover. So if you constantly show that you haven't taken the right protocols or the right protection around personal data and data breaches are happening all the time, regulators can constantly get more and more uh, uh, aggressive towards, the penal, towards penalizing yourself. So we really have to take a look at, well, what do I need to do to make sure that if I do have a breach, that I stay on the right side of the regulator as best as possible. And then you have the proactive, which is like Article 32 of GDPR, where regulators start to mandate the kind of measures you need to put in place, the kind of appropriateness. And again, this one I talked about earlier is the runtime. You have to be able to uh, tool up to make sure that you're staying inside compliance. I like said earlier, just having perfect compliance doesn't mean that you're perfectly safe. There is a, a, a significant difference between both those. But then you'd say, well, how does that affect cyber operations? Well, clearly when you look at reactive, when it, there's a breakage, you have to be able to respond GDPR within 72 hours. And we call this SOAR privacy. And I'm gonna show you a little bit about how SOAR privacy works. But in other words, the bad news is you had a breach. Of course, there's going to be other issues about your client's data being lost, their uh, issues with reputation if the breach is significant and people don't like what you've done business-wise, but you still have to manage it. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, SOAR privacy. But then if you also take a look at the proactiveness, you can, the, one of the new uh, philosophies out is zero trust. Now, I don't have enough time to talk about zero trust today, but it really is taking a look at making sure every entry, every transaction, every user, every profile is set to the correct level and any anomalies are spotted straight away. Again, it's, it, uh, and this was put out by the US government back in May of 
2021, where they really want to protect civil liberties and privacy, saying, well, zero trust is the way to go. So zero trust is a one of those approaches that I would feel that it might uh, resolve some of the requirements in Article 32. But I'm going to go with the um, talk a little bit of privacy in the next two or three slides. Really, uh, and I don't want to get into too much product, but really, if you're familiar with SOAR, and SOAR stands for uh, security operations and response. You're going down through your tasks and you find that you actually have a data breach, which has a significant amount of data, that's private data gone. So from, from a task run system, you would go into the next one and you would say, well, I've got a breach and the breach system will start to say, where, do you, where are you? Where do you live? Uh, what did you lose? How, what kind of data have you lost? So it'll get a very quick profile. And from there using, uh, it's highly evolved algorithms it can actually come up and say well what do you need to do with a regular it can draft an email it can start to say what i need uh, what timeline do i have what uh, things do i have to fill in so you're having very very evolved source systems that even though you've had the bad news of a breach it goes well you can double down and make that worse if you don't manage the regulators uh, uh, response as soon and as best as possible so you get to see that there are solutions now that are sitting inside our SOAR that allow us to do that so with that, I'm just going to say thank you, but I just really want to show you that when you're in a cyber environment, you really have to focus on what, what how do I affect compliance and how does it affect me? And I said earlier, it affects you that you, uh, there's certain levels that you have to prove you're at. Does it make you safe? Questionable. But also in the case of where uh, you are unlucky and a breach has happened, there's certain things that are mandated you must do to ensure you stick with inside the regulator. So yes, cyber and compliance does have a symbiotic relationship, which is key that most of our SOC people understand. So with that, I'm going to say thank you very much. Uh, and I look forward to meeting you in the future um, uh, after events like this. Thank you. Thanks for that, Mike. That was a uh, nice summary. Absolutely appreciated. And uh, we'll be collecting all the slides and all the uh, output and uh, suggested links for everyone at the end. Uh, now for the final part, before we let you escape, hopefully uh, get away for a, a, a late lunch or an early beer, uh, I'll be covering very, very briefly uh, cyber resiliency within this context and specifically just sort of back up recovery, little reference into immutability and uh, air gap. So uh, without uh, much further ado, uh, thank you again for your time. I'm John Murdoch from uh, Celerity. And uh, just to recap and re reset, this, uh, this session has been to try and address a couple of things in relation to Article 32, uh, building operation uh, resilience within the, the, the finance sector. Uh, as I say, elements I'll cover off just very briefly, some cyber resiliency and some backup elements of it. But just to recap and pull it back into to, uh, context, a uh, summary of who it applies to and what the next steps are. Again, fca.org, uh, down the bottom there, you will find all of the information that's there. But it's affecting uh, all, all the banks, builders, societies, effectively people within the, the, the finance uh, uh, sector. And it's about building stronger operational resiliency, uh, not just within the, 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 the space that I'm about to reference, the cyberspace. Uh, it's 31st of March 2022, and by the 31st of March 2022, you need to have defined the following. It also needs to be fully implemented no later than the 31st of March 2025. So again, full detail on the FCA.org uh, in relation to uh, what's required. Expanding further on that, it kind of covers off the sort of five main areas within your business, which would form... Uh, I would suggest part of your business continuity and your resiliency strategies at present. People, process, technology, facilities, and information. And the area, again, we'll just expand on ever so briefly in this is the technology. And the definition that's specifically on the FCA website is underlying systems and architecture to support the provision of a service. So that's fundamentally the statement that they have put down there. That's your exam question. If we then come on to the cyber resilience itself, what, what does it mean? Let's try and shape that. I thought we'd use that uh, well-renowned uh, area of uh, valid information, Wikipedia. So the Wikipedia position is cyber resilience re refers to an entity's ability to continuously deliver the intended outcome despite adverse cyber events. 
Concepts essentially bring the areas of information security, business continuity, continuity and organisation resiliency together. Again, if you hop back to the previous slide, people, process, data, facilities, effectively it's about covering all of that. And cyber resiliency will touch across and support all of the elements within uh, what's been asked from Article 32. You don't need me to, to, to go through things like the cyber attacks and the data breaches. You'll be living, sadly, uh, phishing malware web attacks day in, day out. You're at the coal face, you'll have uh, more battle scars than I do in this particular uh, aspect. And the area we're looking to try and uh, address is resiliency within that, that cyber space and how you could plan to recover from a cyber attack, data breaches, whether it's malicious malware or whether it's a bad actor actually coming in. So that's shaping cyber resiliency and just position it in context of what we're hoping to talk about today. Why do we need to change? Again, just a little bit of positioning from a historical point of view. Back in the good old days, you backed up your data for accidental loss and corruption. You backed it up so that when the chief exec said, oops, I've deleted that presentation, you could send it back to them and everything was hunky-dory. You were backing up, you were archiving at various levels of granularity, again, allowing you to recover to whether it was a point in time to a particular document or particular day. And the majority of the, the methods, the processes and the pre procedures were offend, fundamentally to allow continuous operation. They would ensure your business could recover uh, or you could pull back to a particular point in time if data was deleted, misplaced, lost, whatever. The new landscape is much, much different, uh, much more different. Uh, and again, it's something that uh, uh, you, you, you will live in day in, day out and you will be wrestling with these particular challenges. It's protection of the enterprise data from cyber attack. It's another dimension to it, the data custodian role. So you've gone from just managing the data to be the custodian of the information and the data. And it's related to GDPR, it's related to uh, 5G and how people are actually trying to exploit data to have a data-driven economy and a data-driven business to support that economy. As data becomes more and more critical, more and more fundamental to making those daily decisions, that's where the data custodian role becomes more and more critical uh, to, your, to your operation. And as I say, within this new landscape, new threats from uh, increased societal role of technology, and it's more than just securing your password, sadly, and running firewall, firewalls. Threats now include trusted employees, access through mobile devices, we also are being attacked by state actors and uh, uh, you know uh, ransomware groups like Revo, who are seriously funded, seriously focused, and seriously motivated. And the only thing they have in their mind every day when they get up is to try and actually bring you down and attack you as, a, uh, a, as an individual are wrestling with all of this, plus trying to deliver value to the shareholders, to the business, and to, to that organization and entity that you work within. Again, the environments are getting more and more complex to ensure that you can exploit that data-driven uh, economy and get the value out of it. Mobile devices, external data feeds, and information ecosystems, the cloud, supply chains, partners. Again, Colonial being an example of where all of those areas uh, came together to sadly allow a, a, a breach to be made. The point at the bottom, these are all presenting larger attack surfaces. The more and more you drive innovation in your business by exploiting data, the more and more opportunity you present to the bad actors to allow uh, a targeted attack or to allow creativity to be brought and how they actually seed uh, into your system uh, and, and, and have malware hiding, uh, waiting to just attack at the relevant time. So the landscape, as we all appreciate, has, has changed hugely. Very simply, looking at it, just nice, easy uh, uh, blocks and, and a nice, simple breakdown. If we look at ransomware, increasingly in target and the backup to ensure that you can't recover. This is a, a, a Dell slide. This is some, some simple information from Dell, and they've called it a master server, a media server, and a backup target. So the master server itself on the left, and the backup catalog, this is the control point. Once that's done and that's been encrypted, 
Sadly, that's been infected in this example. That then drops down to what they've called the media server, which is fundamentally the backup server. That's then pushing out to your various backup targets, whether it's disk, uh, tape, or whether it's onto disk. Sadly, through this chain, you've pushed down malware down into everything that you would hope to, to pull back and get you back in a recovered position. So fundamentally, you're now captured, trapped. This is where you now start getting threatened with uh, pay up or we won't open it up. It's this sort of thing, sadly, that happened to organisations such as SEPA. Uh, that one is still trying to recover and it's all over the news. And the targeting on that was very, very clever. It was Christmas Eve, everyone's demob happy, trying to get out to celebrate. Malicious uh, email came in threatening someone. And out of the goodness, they clicked on it, tried to action it. And we're now eight, nine, ten months later and they're still trying to recover from it. So this is, in simple terms, what sort of happened in that particular scenario. What does it impact? This is not just about addressing some of the challenges that the financial uh, services organisation have pushed out and, and, and uh, you know, trying to drive Article 32. This impacts a number of uh, uh, the business initiatives and the business outcomes that are, are, are impacted. Downtime. Your backup uh, it remains unchangeable. You cannot recover. Financial impact, you cannot get the business back online. Therefore, you're losing money by the second, by the minute, by the day. Cyber insurance, again, if you have robust policies, recoverability in, bar, uh, 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 in place, immutability, you can use that to enhance and ensure that those insurance policies are correct for you. Brand protection, one of the things that's just unrecoverable from. Again, if you get hit, you come down, you've lost money, you've lost customer, but how do you get the trust back in your brand? All those years you've built uh, onboarding customers and differentiating yourself out is now gone in that. Those are hard, hard yards to claw back. Again, just to finalise, compliance, safeguards, addressing things such as Article 32, and it will continue and there will be ongoing changes to those policies. So it does impact broader uh, and, and an element of that is that compliance and safeguard within Article 32. How can Celerity help? How do organisations like ourselves engage? Again, on the left-hand side, a nice simple uh, uh, picture on how we would engage with our customers to offer immutable and or air gap backup. In simple terms, we back up the data, we supply some logic, object blocks, some smart stuff at the back end to ensure it's protected. We then drop it into your lock back up with some ransomware cannot change it. Write once, read many times. We then, if need be, can do <coughs> clean copy and a full restore for you. So it's layered security. We can offer a hybrid model integrating with private and public cloud. So again, you're covered in respect to uh, your transformational strategy. Full analysis and reporting, complete transparency of your environment at any point in time. We are monitoring and pushing those sort of uh, uh, MI and BI reports out. Get a near zero recovery point. I've got a little slide in a second, only two more minutes to go. A little slide in a second, that pinch from IBM, which I think shows it pretty, pretty, pretty well. Integration with S, uh, S3 using standard APIs. And as, that, that, as a business, we can integrate that with existing services you may have or Celerate themselves have a broader services portfolio where we can take you on a continual journey to ensure that you're monitoring and managing your cyber posture in relation to the threats that are out there and the changes to legislation that are coming. So at simplest levels, that's how Celerity can engage and support your business. If we then just drop that to a, a slightly more detailed, just 30 seconds, that's an example of, of one of the architectural uh, outputs we put for, uh, forward for one of our customers. As I say, that's an, uh, an example. So for that particular customer, within their primary data centre, we put the on-premise backup system solution, which was ours, and we put the block storage re uh, uh, repository as well. We were pulling from their virtual machines, the phys physical uh, as well, pulling it into the appliances, and then we were backing that copy up to an identical setup in the secondary data centre uh, uh, within Celerity. And we're a big fan of the 3 2, 1 rule. And we would have split this out and had those three copies for you. This is then checked, it's cleaned. 
we validate all the data, we ensure it is clean, we then drop it into the clean room, we identify everything that's on it, remove anything that's bad, and we then drop that into a bucket to ensure that that is one of the point in time where we can pull back the recovery. The restore areas we can come to are, are all the standard industry ones you would expect. So again, this was on site within the customer, the appliance is deployed, we were then backing that up to the secondary data centre, flashing a copy to the third and doing all the clever stuff down here. So I will leave on that. I will finish with a quick IBM slide, which I think just shows where we get back to the near zero point in time recovery, and then we'll move on to the Q&A. So IBM Spectrum and Virtualize is one of IBM's products, uh, and again, logical corruption protection, a lot of object points provided, and it's a very, very strong solution. So production system there, and we'll take a back up at six o'clock in the morning. So that's safeguard copy one. We run then for another couple of hours, and our policy is in the morning we're backing up every three hours. So at nine o'clock, we take a second back up point in time, and we drop that down through the architecture we've shown you, and down onto the, uh, uh, onto the uh, uh, clean vault. We take a third copy at 12, we then take a fourth copy at three. We then take a final copy at six. Bang, corruption found. We've actually been hit, and this is us now getting any panic. What do we do? We try to recover. So we open up safeguard copy one. We found actually that that was corrupted uh, and was made it into the backup. We then drop to safeguard copy two. We find that that's actually been corrupted. No use to us as well, malicious malware in it. We then drop to copy three. We find that that is safe. That one's a clean copy, no malware in it. We use that as the recovery point, and then that's us back to full production. So effectively, we recover to the 12 o'clock point, uh, considering we went into the uh, uh, the boom scenario at round about six, between six and nine that evening. So that's sort of a process-led uh, approach and how it works in practical terms. I'll close off now. I'll thank you for your time. We're going to open up to uh, a discussion point. I've taken a little longer than I anticipated, but hopefully it's been uh, relevant and valuable. Uh, if I could ask all the speakers now just to come off camera, uh, we'll open up. I'll thank you for your time, and we'll open up for a, a, an open, honest debate. Any questions, please drop them through on the uh, uh, on the messaging, or please come off uh, uh, mute and uh, uh, put the question direct to us. Thank you for your time and panel. If I can ask you to uh, cameras on and uh, uh, mute off, please. Thank you. Hi, hello everyone. Thank you for your time there. Uh, I, I, apologies, my background has changed. It's a, a different platform we're on for the Q and A, uh, and I, I don't have the beauty of uh, uh, having a green screen at the back of me. Uh, if I could just bring in the other uh, panelists, uh, if they are there, excellent. And good morning. I, 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 again, just to set and uh, uh, make sure there is no confusion. The uh, uh, chap down the bottom right with the body warmer on is not Keith. Keith unfortunately <laughs> had to Keith unfortunately had to run off. He was double booked. So uh, Martin from Cyber Prism has very kindly stepped in to uh, uh, to the breach. So hello Martin and thank you, Mike. Irene, always a pleasure. Nice. Uh, 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 thank you. Always a pleasure to work <coughs> with you. Just waiting on some questions coming in. I think we've got a couple getting tight through. Oh, there we go, Irene. Straight to yourself. There's a, it seems, the question is, it seems to be a real challenge sometimes with the, the chief exec and MD wanting access to everything in the company network, Irene. So how, how do you manage a CEO and an MD and tell them they can't have access to everything without offending them? Yeah. Uh, sort of thing. And I, you know, obviously comment from yourself, Irene, but we'll open that one up to the, uh, to the rest of the, uh, the panel as well. 
Yeah, thanks, John, for the question, or whoever put the question there. Yeah, um, yeah it, it can be a difficult and slightly awkward conversation, depending, I suppose, on the role of the person that's going to have to challenge your CEO. So if you're the data protection officer, um, like myself, then you are able to speak the truth. You know, you can speak with authority because that's part of your role under the, the GDPR regulation that, that you have to monitor and advise people about what their obligations are. And just because, you know, it's somebody at the top of the organisation does not mean that they don't need to comply the same as everybody else in an organisation. So for me, it would be about taking the, the approach with them that that security culture and data protection culture within your own organisation has got to be led by them at the top. And um, you've got to lead by example, and I would refer them back to the Data Protection Act and the accountability principle, um, because they are responsible as a data controller, and not just about being responsible, but they need to evidence that they are compliant. So if your CEO is not following your own policies and procedures, i.e. your access control and, and not allowing everybody access to everything, it should be specific to the function that they are doing, then they're not demonstrating compliance. And your access control is there as a real safeguard. But as I said earlier, it has to be relevant to the role that you're doing. So it's about being able to have that strong um, authority and challenge any member within an organization, whether it's your CEO or managing director or, or whoever it may be, that they, they need to comply to the policies, which is about managing and limiting and controlling the access right across your whole organization. So I suppose in summary, they've got to talk the talk and walk the walk. Um, we're, we're trying to protect the organization and they're part of that. Leadership from the top down. It was one of the key things that was pinging about question time all last night about COP26 and various other things. So again, if you're trying to build that uh, cyber from the ground up culture, where it's mm -hmm. cyber aware constantly, it's absolutely needs to be driven from the top down, Irene. Uh, yeah. On that, so that that's not spot on. Thank you for that. I, oh, I would what? actually, I, I metaphor like that. It, it's like the uh, American Secret Service. They're there to protect the president and they have the ultimate say in where he goes, how he goes and what he does. You know, if they believe that he, he's put himself in danger, they stop him. And they have they have the right to override their commander in chief. And we have to have yeah. the same type of principles. Depending upon which commander in chief it is, I think it actually <laughs> resonated a little bit with some than it did with others. But we're, we're past that <laughs> orange speed bump now, so we'll just keep moving. I think that's a that, that, uh, fairly, fairly direct one to my, myself. Is immutable the fix to ransomware? Sadly, there's no fix, uh, and, and it's a, a, a continual posture change, and it's continually looking at it. What I would say it is immutable is probably the strongest process, procedure, technology wraparound on people you can have that, can, that will get you back to a, a recovery point, an acceptable recovery point, quicker. Uh, again, there are some high-profile ones still out there in the industry, uh, some in Scotland, some not in Scotland, where they have been wrestling with that recovery now for about eight, nine, ten months. Uh, and so again, immutable is certainly not the silver bullet, it's certainly not the fix, uh, but it's something if you haven't got it in place, I, you know, certainly as a, as a company, and I would suggest as a panel, it's something we would advise all our customers to be looking at, just so you have that ability to drop down when the boom time hits, to actually come back to a particular point. Someone the other day was, was having a discussion with me and said, it's, it's, this is not just about actually recovering some data or get your, getting your uh, uh, presentation back to the chief exec. This is your business, God. This is your hard work. This is what you've invested your time, your effort, your passion in. Uh, it's gone. Reputation, money. You can't cut an invoice. You can't send out a bill. You can't communicate to your customers to say, don't worry, everything's good. So to, to, to summarise, it, 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 I don't think there is a, a silver bullet, certainly not a fix, but I would suggest if you haven't got that in place, it's an absolutely strong, critical key part of your uh, uh, continual uh, uh, posture improvement. So on that one. Uh, so let's just get another couple coming in. I'm just trying to make sure we get them all. Thing. Ah, there, there we go. Uh, Martin, I'll put up uh, a little one to your uh, uh, good self. Uh, uh, Mike, and then we'll oh, see if you can run for yourself, Michael. So, Martin, do we think the industry gets the exposure that OT, uh, uh, what OT opens up to, and do you think we're seeing the right action, say, at board level, uh, to, to 
to for the awareness, I would suggest, as well as the practicalities of, of what they need to do. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll put my glasses on for the next one, I read. <laughs> Okay, we're good to go, John. Yeah, yeah okay. Sorry, so a question that's asked quite a lot and, and is uh, becoming more and more topical, I suppose. Um, I suppose the first thing to say is that um, every sector and indeed every company is different. Um, there are different drivers on different industries and there's a different level of awareness and desire um, to take action in, in diff various different companies. Um, I think that... Compared to two years ago, when we'd be saying people just don't get this at all, there's much more visibility now of the threats to the OT. We've had one or two high profile attacks. Um, probably the best known example would be the East Coast pipeline attack. And I think that has genuinely raised awareness. And I, and I think we're now getting to the point where, where industry in general and companies do, they do understand that there is a clear and present threat to their OT. And of course, they more than understand the importance of OT to their industrial processes and their businesses. But I think this is raising another issue because as they start to explore this, they start to realize uh, quite how, how big the problem is. Or to put it in a slightly different way, how much work it's going to take for us to get control of the security of our industrial processes. And therefore, even whilst understanding the level of the threat, it can still sort of fall into the too difficult or too expensive pile. Mm. So the key thing we have to do now is I think this is largely about the use of technology. Um, and I don't think it's about um, setting AI free on your industrial processes. Um, I don't think you want all of the spurious alerts that that's going to generate. I think it's about using technology to empower humans. And that's certainly what, what we're doing. Uh, and if you do that, um, and if you put the humans in the place where they should be, which is the decision makers in all this, then I think you can make industrial cybersecurity both feasible and affordable. And I think that's where we need to go next. Qu quick complimentary ones just hit. It's actually, again, it's, it's Quite an interesting one, Mark. It's probably one that we might open up to the, the, the panel a little. Uh, any suggestions that what the advice and guidance that people are being given within the OT space, is that going to impact performance and productivity? Seems to be the, uh, the point of the question uh, uh, here, Mark. What, what, what are you seeing out there? Are you? I think... Yeah, okay, great. I, th I suspect this was uh, prompted by what Nick was talking about, which is essentially segregation. And segregation has been on a bit of a journey. So uh, I'm not really the technical one in the company, I'm the good looking one, but I'll, I'll, address, it from my, uh, I'll address it from my perspective. Um, so uh, two years ago, again, um, the advice from any cyber engineer would be to have a very clear air gap uh, for instance, between your IT or, and OT domains, or indeed between any networks that you really want to effectively segregate. And, and Nick, I think, was quite important on how feasible that really is. You then get to um, a point where people actually want their IT to talk um, to their OT. Well, actually, wrong. The, the stage before that is having your OT talk to your IT. So allowing your IT to see what's happening in your industrial processes. Mm -hmm. um, and you can do that by using various systems which allow one-way communication only. Um, and the, the theory was that that would uh, protect your OT because nothing's getting in from the IE to the OT. It's only allowing communication from OT outwards. But that doesn't really um, conform to the requirements of modern industry. Um, so IT-OT convergence, I think, is probably more about two-way communication. It's about being able to host AI systems, if that's the right term, on your IT domain, which then allow you to fine tune what's happening in your OT domain. And th there are now, we are now dealing with devices that could sit in a DMZ between the IT and OT domains and allow that two way communication to happen safely. Broadly, in a very non technical way, one way of doing this is for the device to actually recognize what type of communication is happening. So you could say, okay, that IP address actually is allowed to talk to that other IP address across the DMZ, but it's only allowed to send rate control signals. It can't send uh, temperature control signals, can't send on-off signals. If you see anything else, 
then you either tell your advice to, to block it or, or alert you. This starts to, and this is interesting, because this starts to facilitate ITOT convergence rather than necessarily seeing ITOT convergence as a, as a huge threat from a security point of view. Um, the other thing that Nick mentioned, though, if we're going to do this, is asset discovery. And we know that asset discovery is difficult and quite labor intensive in OT because you can't really use active measures in the way that you'd use in IT. So developing technology that can assist the humans with asset discovery, make it less clipboard based and a little bit more technology based. There's an awful lot of work going into that uh, at the moment. And the only other thing I'd say is that um, if you're dealing with legacy items of equipment, especially in the OT domain, might be something like a hospital scanner, you might be dealing with an item of equipment that can no longer really be patched or not economically patched. So there's another very clear use case here for devices that can be connected directly to OT that is, that is legacy in that way. So that whereas the manufacturer may be saying to you, I'm sorry, you're going to have to pay £2 million for a new scanner, Actually, you don't. You pay maybe a few thousand. You connect this device in, and it makes it um, a secure system. So you update the device, you maintain the security of the system, and it would allow you to maintain conformity with um, Cyber Central's Plus, for instance, and, and run that item of equipment onto the natural operational life, rather than a sort of artificial security lifespan. Well, and thank you. I forgot to say at the start, I know Mike had a, a, a hard sort of fix, a, a close at uh, a 12. However, Mike, a very loaded one's came in, okay. uh, which I, I, if you have two minutes, sir, I'm certainly sure. going to put it to you and then we can open it up to the panel. Mike, where do you, where within that IBM world, uh, where, where, do you, where is cyber defence going from a business point of view? Well, where it is going and where it needs to be, number one, the threatscape is constantly getting more aggressive. So that's, it's never going to go away. Uh, so that's the first thing I think we've all realized. Secondly, it's got to become more visible. Um, if you take, for an instance, uh, like a financial institution where your executives might sit on a Tuesday morning and look at key KPIs, like things like new accounts opened, look at the return on investment we have with our portfolio which are positive KPIs. Negative KPIs would be things like the amount of um, defaults accrued over the last seven days. These are the kind of KPIs that banks will look at. You rarely see, well, how many threats were, were, were successful or halted, i.e. they're a enterprise KPI. Um, we've got to start seeing that it's got to go mainstream, that the business realize that there are negative KPIs that have to be surfaced at uh, the boardroom meetings that are happening once a week, maybe on a Tuesday morning. And um, we're not seeing that quite yet. That has to be the case. And the way I've shown that is if you're in manufacturing, you'll always have a quality KPI. And a quality KPI means you're not doing great, but it's still one of the KPIs you would use at a boardroom meeting. So that's the first thing. We definitely have to make it more stream uh, and we have to embrace the, uh, the negativity of uh, cyber at a boardroom meeting. The other thing then is, again, it gets back to what I talked about earlier, continual process improvement. The Threatscape will continue to evolve and so must we. Uh, you cannot let yourself fall behind. And that means you've got to look at your people. Are they trained? You've got to look at your products. Have you got the right products? Have you got the right process? So it's just an ever, it's, it is a an ever evolving uh, Threatscape and therefore we have to move fast in the speed of threat and ever evolve as well and make it visible. So the two things is, Definitely continual process improvement, build it in across the board to really push hard to make sure visibility is well understood. And it's just not the only time you get into a boardroom is when the, you know, the, the problem has gone bang. And that's when you become famous. You should have representation in the boardroom by your KPIs. And therefore, you've got to make them crystal clear. Got it. Understood. Mike, I, I appreciate it. I've uh, my failed you ransom for three minutes uh, longer than I had promised. Uh, the rest of the panel stay on. We'll have a, a wrap-up question that just came in there and I'll let everyone go. Mike, thank you very much for that. Uh, well, this is quite a good one. I think we'll part on uh, uh, this question. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll open this one up to the, 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 the three of us that are left. As I say, I'm just conscious of the time. How do you practically go about testing the effectiveness of the measures that we have implemented for security? Not a bad one. That's I think, a good one. That's <laughs> quite a good We I, I Thank you for throwing that one in. I think we will, I, I don't think we'll get anything better than that one. We'll leave on that question. And I'm going to load this right on to you, Irene. 
No problem at all, John. Thank you. Um, You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the key things, though, is um, it's not just about assessing the effectiveness of your technical or digital measures. We can't forget at all about the physical security measures as well so any kind of practical testing has to cover both so you've got your penetration testing your vulnerability scanning obviously after you've installed the technology and um, that you're putting in as a, as a measure you could go through the stages of and i know martin mentioned cyber essentials plus but also your iso 27001 you know that will allow you to to measure against what 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 good looks like um, but also from the physical side, um, you know, run an exercise, run a test exercise, tying it in with your business continuity, but make it data protection breach or cybersecurity breach focused um, to then walk through the stages of how you would actually get back to business as usual and be able to restore your data. Um, for me, the key thing as well is about checking your staff's awareness and um adherence to policies so do you walk through the building and check that the, the, they do have a clear desk policy is their password stuck on um screens is their password stuck on the wall like the very famous picture of prince william that had yeah. the password behind him yeah. when the media took a picture so <laughs> it's 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 the digital technological security measures that you need to test but also the physical and the staff's um, adherence that's a really good way to to test how effective your measures are spot on thank you Irene. martin yeah great and i agree with everything Aaron i said especially from the people perspective mm -hmm. so test exercises etc cetera, etc cetera. of course um monitoring systems nowadays ones we use can monitor people's behavior as well this is mm -hmm. controversial for very obvious reasons but you can get quite a good picture as to who's doing what on the network. Uh, and you uh, probably ought to be aware of people who are, for instance, leaving the company or involved in other difficult conversations with the company um, as, as being particularly vulnerable to this sort of thing. But if I was to look at it from an OT perspective and a, a very technical perspective, I think the answer I would give you is in a virtual environment. So going in to hard test your OT to see if uh, your segregation's working, see if your monitoring system's actually generating the alerts you want it to, uh, is a good way of taking your OT down and collapsing the company. <laughs> and more and more, this is what we're doing. So we're building virtual environments which mirror the OT domain of a company. And then we're either uh, getting people and or, and there is a, a use for AI here, almost in the same way that a chess computer would use it, to develop a, um, a virtual aggressor, which learns as it goes mm -hmm. along and tries various different ways of getting into your network. Um, all done virtually, um, because obviously you can't afford to take down your 24 seven OT network at any point. <laughs> yep, no, that, that, that's, that's a, a fair point. Big thing in the uh, Innovation Festival at Northumbria Water last week, all the digital twinning that they were talking about. So, you know, you know that sort of concept yep. of, of a, mm -hmm. We're we're working, yeah, we're um, working with, with DSTL on on uh, something very similar for the sort of yep. um, government and, area. Interesting stuff. Uh, I, I, you know, how would I address uh, and what do we say to our customers about practically testing? It's about continually testing the posture. Uh, sadly, this is to use the horrible J word, the journey. It's something that will just never go away. It'll go away mm -hmm. when the baddies actually stop attacking you. Right? So, and that's never, ever going to happen. So this is a project that will just continually roll. So it's about continual posture uh, te uh, checking. Uh, and again, some of the stuff Mike talked about before he went, threat hunting, breach and attack technologies, mm -hmm. those are the sort of wraparound areas we are speaking to our customers about uh, that we believe are, are, are like like you, you're doing, Martin, and the, the practical stuff from yourself, Irene, actually, in inverted commas, attacking what it looks like in the real world. But you've, you've digital twinned it, you've segmented it off, we're doing, we, we're advising exactly the same way, breaching, breaching attack technologies, getting the real malware, taking the bad bit out of it and simulating that real attack on you to see how your posture and how your defences react to it. So there are some practicalities out there. I'm just, I'm, 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 I'm conscious of the time yeah. uh, on it. I don't want to keep anyone hanging on. It's, it's, it's lunchtime and slash the pubs are open in a wet Scotland. <laughs> uh, Irene, I, 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 Martin, it's uh, always, always a pleasure uh, uh, to engage and pick your brains. I thank you for that. I'll thank Mike uh, as well from an IBM point of view. 
Uh, and clearly, uh, thank you everyone who uh, uh, gave us the time to uh, attend and drop the questions. And hope you have a lovely Friday, final day of Cyber Month. Ho uh, uh, hope, hopefully it's a good one for you. And on that note, I will thank you on behalf of uh, all of the panel. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Have a lovely day. Thanks to all.